So welcome to the Everyday Heroes podcast. I'm Philip Brady, and I'm delighted to welcome my friend, colleague, chum, a professional fellow singer, peer, all this kind of stuff, uh, Steve-O. And Steve, I don't even know your surname. Clark. Clark. Steve-O Clark. Steve-O Clark. I always have you in my phone as uh, Steve-O Coach Hybrid Elite. <laughs> <laughs> and I think ECA could be somewhere there now. I need to change it. But maybe just for anybody. So the purpose of this episode and podcast is really just I, and Steve, for you as well, and I think I said this to you before in a conversation about the podcast, but I really just want to inspire people that you could be beside somebody in a queue in Sainsbury's at Tesco and not realize how inspiring the person beside you is or how inspiring to other people they are. So I want to try and capture stories from people like yourself and other people that have been on the show and will be on the show to show somebody listening that actually you can be inspiring to other people and you can become the hero in your own story and create whatever it is that you want in your life. So maybe just to say thank you for being here. It's appreciated and welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. You know, I love I love our conversations. We we caught up a hell of a lot over the what was it last week last weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's always good to talk to you, Phil. Likewise. And maybe just for anybody listening, then Steve, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? So what's going on for you at the moment? What kind of chapter in your life are you? Uh, kind of currently writing or creating whoa uh right so there's so many chapters that are flipping open and being closed and i'm going like three chapters ahead and then going back chapters um so recently we've just bought our house which is a big deal and we were renting we were told that you know the landlord's looking to get rid of the house. Are you in a position to buy? And we were like, nope, we're saving for a wedding, which was the chapter that we were currently on, <laughs> you know, saving and organizing a wedding. Um, and then we kind of had to flick forward a few chapters to organize getting the house and mortgage and stuff sorted out. So now that that's done, it's kind of, okay, let's go back to where we were. Um, I um. I kind of didn't want to start with my job, but, you know, it's, it's a big part of me. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, I am general manager and one of the head coaches at ECA Belfast. Uh, I've been coaching with uh, Paddy Joe and Lenny for around about seven, eight years, something like that. Can never really remember because it kind of has flown by and I've enjoyed every second of it. So it's hard to kind of keep track how long I've actually been doing that. I have a son called Oliver who is going to be eight in what, like a week or two weeks. Oh, Jesus. Uh, the 20th. Anyway, he's going to be eight soon. Um, beautiful fiance, Janice. Like I said, we've just bought our house. We're going to be married next May. Um, yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of chapters and, I'm sure we'll probably get into more depth about that in in the in the podcast. Mm. And a musician. Oh, and a musician. Yeah, I'm actually only just getting back. Like, I, I used to do a hell of a lot of gigging. Like, obviously before uh, COVID and stuff. So I was in a wedding band, and I went out in my own solo, out into bars and stuff. Um, did quite a bit of singing and playing guitar. Um, and then COVID happened. All kind of shut down and stuff. And to be honest, I was kind of happy with the. The break from it um but now i'm going back out there i've got a couple of dates coming up in the next few months which will which will be a test you know getting back into it and stuff um but i'm looking forward to it looking forward to sing again in front of people because there's only so much that i can do sitting in the house before i kind of you know itch for a wee bit more yeah yeah what about you? You 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 out gigging or what? What have you got on musically? Well, I'm I'm having shoulder surgery, so I actually have, have gigs coming up that I have to cancel. So I'll have oh, to wow. get them covered by somebody else. Like we have a WhatsApp group of musicians to play in the venue in Bangor that I play, and so I'll just post it in there, and they'll be able to cover. But I won't be able to play for a while, and I have my oh, guitar man. beside me all the time, but I don't pick it up nearly as much as I want to but I'm trying to also increase the gap from me to it so that I'm itching to get back to it rather than just not arsed. So mm. 
I've noticed that kind of like desire to pick it up a little bit more recently, which I'm kind of excited about. And I need to learn new songs and I want to learn new songs as well. So it's a kind of cool tension that I'm trying to play with so that I'm more motivated to get back to it. So it's a little bit of a couple of things coming at once, not yeah. being able to uh, and wanting to, if that makes yeah. sense. So that's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah, that's it's like you were saying about, you know, you, you pick the guitar up every now and again, but probably not as much as you you would like to or whatever. Like I'm the same. I've got the, the acoustic guitars in the living room and it's sat right beside the the entrance from the, the living room into the kitchen. So you like I'm passing it all the time. And my electric guitar, my amplifier is actually set up on the, the landing just outside. Um, and I purposely put it there as well because it used to be in the cupboard. Yeah, on the landing, and I was like, yeah. "Okay, I'll put it there because if I'm, if it's sitting there, then it, you know it's less hassle to take the guitar out and plug it in and play some stuff." But yeah, I'm on the same sort of boat. I need to pick it up a bit more and learn some new songs. I suppose it's it kind of gets easy with musicians. Like the classics are classics because you know everybody loves them, and when you know all the songs that everybody's going to get up and dance to and sing along to, there's kind of this kind of feeling like you don't really need to learn the new stuff because yeah. you've got two hours worth of stuff that you know is gold anyway mm. but it is nice to kind of refresh learn new stuff yeah and i find that i default to like wonderwall and stuff like this and i'm like oh my goodness my street credibility is just decreased because it's like what's the somebody has a guitar at a, a party or whatever oh wonderwall <laughs> right the usual spot the classics are classics, right? Yeah, it just reminds me of university being yeah. at a, like a student hall and yeah. we're all getting ready to go out and there was a guitar. Yeah. Do you know Wonderwall? Yeah. Play Wonderwall. 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, so tell me about you and like this, you have, you have a series of adventures that you're kind of embarking on, but... I don't know which one you want to land on and kind of use maybe as a thread for the conversation, but tell me about like that kind of start of some of these adventures for you. So typically when we go on the kind of hero's journey, there's like a call or a calling that we feel drawn towards something for that. We're going to dedicate us to and give our full self to, do you remember what that was like for any of these kind of areas that you're on this adventure in? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm probably going to stick along the lines of the, the fitness industry um, because it dips um, from, you know, the, the beginning. It, it, I, I started in the fitness industry because Oliver was coming along. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, that kind of covers that chapter in my life, having a, a son and being a dad. Mm. Um, and then my progression through, you know, my career so far, I kind of you know, dips into, you know, my family, um, my fiance, the support that they give me and everything um, while, while I'm working and while I'm doing all of this sort of stuff. So, yeah, the, if you, know, you want me to just go in about like, like how I got started and like the kind of calling. Um, yeah. So it was, it's, it's a very, very vivid memory. Um, I was lying on the sofa at the, at the time I was, a an actor. Okay. So I, I have a drama degree and I was an actor and work was very off and on. So between projects, you would have been, you know, standing on to, you know, job seekers or whatever it was and kind of trying to fill your days as best you could, um, doing auditions and blah, blah, blah. But I remember being on the sofa and I don't know if you've ever watched Breaking Bad. Have you ever seen it? Mm -hmm. So I've watched, I think there's maybe about six or seven seasons in Breaking Bad. And each episode's about an hour long. And I think there's at least 10. There could be more in each season. And I watched the entire seven, six or seven seasons in the space of two weeks. Because all I was doing was lying on the sofa and eating one pound pizzas for Mazda and drinking whatever alcohol was underneath the, was in the larder. So, you know, like bottles of Baileys and stuff that was left over from Christmas and stuff. And I remember, cause it was, it was around February. 
that I, I February 2014, I want to say, 2014, that I finished the last episode of Breaking Bad and kind of just went, I need to do something here because Oliver's going to be, you know, around. He, he, he was due to be born in July. And I was just thinking I need to do something with myself here. It's not good enough to be lying on the sofa and wasting time. And, you know, at that time I was really, really over, overweight. So that's how I got into the, the, the gym. I knew Lenny from gigging for music. So he was the manager of Cosgroves. Oh. His dad owns the bar. Oh, all right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, actually, it goes even further back than that. So I was very, very good friends with his cousin who worked in the bar whenever Lenny was managing it. And then Lenny said that he was looking for musicians and, you know, I got introduced and stuff. And that's how I ended up gigging in the bar. And while I was doing that, I, I knew that Lenny was starting the gym and, you know, trying to get out of the bar and stuff. So whenever I decided that I was going to s- start a gym, start, you know, getting healthier and fitter and stuff, I kind of had a relationship with him already. And I was like, at least this guy isn't going to tell me lies. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's not going to blow smoke up my ass. He's going to tell me, you know, like it is. Um, so that's how I started going to, at the time, hybrid fitness. So I was a, a client of the gym uh, to begin with did every single program that they probably had the offer and then at that time they were getting very busy and they just wanted to um i suppose spend more time with their family um have some time off so they offered me a couple of hours you know you know the programs you know the movements you know the clients do you want to come down and help us out for a couple of hours and then once i got a taste of that i was like i'm kind of into this i like i like where this is going and i like helping people and i like having fun i think that's the main thing thing you know obviously aside from helping people getting healthier and fitter and feeling better about themselves and moving better like i love connecting with people um so yeah that's that's where the kind of calling came whenever i made that kind of switch from client to coach Mm. went and got my certification and then whenever at the time it was the elite um certification I was on the very first elite, uh, in, in the very first elite class. Wow! So I was I was one of the OG guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know any of that. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, it's it's been a been a long old road, like. But the 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 the, the main reason that I started was because Oliver was going to be born, and I knew that I at least needed to change myself, and I needed to take responsibility and grow up. And when, when, when you're trying to become that version of like father, role model, hero, you could say to your son too, right? And to yourself, that's not always easy to live up to. So were you kind of like, was there any hesitation around like, no, this is the path? Because it's nearly an identity shift as well for you, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a weird one. Um, because like thinking back on it at the time, I was very, very tunnel visioned. I was like, but well, it probably goes back before I made the decision to actually change. Like my dad and my mom and, you know, people had already said to me, you know, you know, you're, you're holding a, a bit of weight and stuff. You, you know, you should really think about, you know, getting a bit healthier, eating a bit healthier, doing something about it or whatever. And you, you know. I've always said that everybody has their line and whenever you cross that line, it's, it's your decision to make. No one can make it for you. Once you've crossed that line, it's like, okay, now I'm committed to it. And there was so many attempts of people trying to get me to to cross that line earlier than I was ready to. Yeah. And once I did, it was tunnel vision. Um, I'm a very all or nothing type person. And so whenever it came to losing weight, like I think I lost about six stone in about three months. Like it went really, really quickly. Um, and I 
in the same sense, like everything that they were telling me to do, I was like, yep, I'm going to do it. Yep, I'm going to eat that. Yep, I'm going to do that exercise that way. But at the same time, I'm going home to find out why. And is there a way that I can make it better or do it quicker? <laughs> so Unreal. So <laughs> I didn't know any of this stuff, Steve. This is why it's kind of like, this is why I love these conversations because I'm learning so much about the people that are around me and in my life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's weird because I I feel like I've probably told the story quite a few times that, you know, it, it feels like it was so long ago that it's it's you know in your head whenever you start telling it again, it's like all right, change the record kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, but it's so I, pro to... I probably haven't. Yeah, it's it's probably new to people that you know know me now that don't know that I used to be a client of the gym or whatever. Unreal. And then when you were at that kind of point, so it sounds like you had probably, you could say like mentors or people that were around you that were helping you then on this journey as well. So does any of that kind of stand out to you? Like who was part of that uh, evolution of you and what kind of helped you then along that kind of path? Uh, like who was around or what were some of the influences from those kind of people for you in your journey? Um, well, the, the first person in terms of, uh, an influence would have been one of my good friends, um, Kieran, uh, McNichol. Um, he, he was actually training in the gym and he's the one, like I, I, I'd mentioned to him, you know, like, I really need to do something here. Like, you know, I need to sort this out and he goes, come down to the, the gym with me. I, I get personal training from Paddy Joe. Um, so come down and share the session with me. And if you like it, then, you know, at least that's the introduction made. So it literally, like, he, he's a very, very pushy kind of guy. Like, if he makes a plan, he's, like, telling you about it every 20 minutes. He's like, we're still doing this. We're still doing this. Even today, you know, we're, we're organizing, like, nights out and stuff. He's like, are we all still, you know, is this still the plan? Like, So if it wasn't for him and his persistence, it like, I might have rubbed the line out and waited for a wee bit longer. Um, In terms of mentorship, like, it's always been Lenny and Polly Joe, you know, like, it's only now looking back that you kind of realize like, well, I realize how, how lucky I've kind of fallen where like, I, I don't have a bad gym experience story. Like we, we get very many clients that, you know, yeah. maybe not even clients, but people in general where they, they go, oh, I went to this place and I experienced something terrible or I went to a class and there was 40 people and I didn't get the attention that I needed. And like, I don't have any of that because I started out training with Patty, Joe and Lenny, and they obviously had high hopes and high aspirations and maybe not at the time knew exactly where they were going to go, but they had a vision of, you know, what they wanted long term. Um, so in terms of mentorship, like for coaching, the two of those guys were like invaluable. Like, like, like I had everything that I needed in that one place. If, if I needed to learn anything about, you know, if I needed a book to learn from, they had the book. If I needed taught on how to write a program, they were there to help me. Um, and at the same time, they were still learning themselves. So every time they went out to a course or they went and learned something new, they came back and goes, right, this is what I learned on this weekend in Manchester, whatever course they were doing. Like, let's do this and let's try and see how we can implement it with the guys in the gym. And that's a continuous thing even today. You know, the, like I said to you before, the, I was on the first elite course and I, I was actually talking to Andrew the other day and i was saying you know what if i could i would set the course again because the thing has just evolved yeah. over the years and i'm like yeah. what, what the guys get on that course now is nothing compared to what i got the first time or even maybe the second or third course round because they're constantly learning but it's not just the the students that benefit from that it's it's us as coaches because we are obviously you know using that information with our clients um and learning along with them, which is amazing because the, the introductions to people like yourself, the introductions to 
like you think about the, the elite, some of the people who are in that room, um, there's more people there that can help you get to where you want to be than there are people that can hold you back. And that's, that's, that's a special kind of room to be in. And it wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for those two guys. Yeah. And I, I'm on a coaching program at the moment. And one of the things that was mentioned recently was whenever we create like a vision of what we want to work towards, there's always going to be people in our life that will hold us back. Mm. And we can try and use all our time, energy and attention to change their mind. Or we can take all that time, energy and attention, just focus on our vision and take action towards it. And it's yeah. the same, like when you're surrounded by the people that want you to move forward, it's a totally different energy, literally, because you're not trying to change other people. They're demanding a better version of you. It's so different. Yeah. yeah. And it and you feel it. So I, I said to Lenny after that the, the summit, like, that's the environment I want to be around. Because yeah imagine what it can do for people that are in the environment where people are holding them back yeah that's it's it's amazing the way that when you're in that kind of environment you feel the restraints or the rules around it and yeah. you're like no you like so um i'm trying to think of an example so let's well, let's say for is, example but here's a bad one pts must have six packs yeah. It's a story. Yeah. It's made up. 100%. 100%. 100%. It's made up. It's all bullshit, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. I love that. It's all bullshit, baby. Maybe just to explain at the summit, I was doing my talk and it's called Butterflies, Trees and Bullshit. And the camera, like a photographer that was there was at one of the, I don't know if I, I told you this, Steve, but he was at one of the masterminds where I did a very similar talk. And I, I said this a couple of times that it's all bullshit. And this guy, Connor, uh, just out of nowhere, just screamed it out with so <laughs> much passion. I'm like, I, I cued him up then at the summit to say, Connor, I'm not going to say it. I want you to launch this thing. And he killed it. It was just so funny. And he added the baby bit at the end. And I really like that. I think it's a good addition. So I used only three words. I think the fourth word, baby, at the end. It's all bullshit, baby. <laughs> when it's said with energy is so good. But sorry. So I, I derailed there, Steve-O. <laughs> and you were going to share an example of a story or a thing that isn't true, potentially, right? Uh, yeah, well, I was, I was just thinking about the... The, the feeling of like restraint the rules um if you're in a situation where you feel like like someone doesn't want you to grow or or there's a fear it's like it's probably not even the fact that somebody doesn't want you to grow it's maybe that they're afraid that you are going to grow and what's that going to happen what's going to happen yeah. when you do or if you do um so could you imagine where i would have been if my family weren't supportive of me going to the gym and taking things as seriously as I was taking them at the time. I remember my mom asking me, was whey protein steroids? <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, but you, like, they, they could have very easily, because at, at the time, like I said, I was, I was acting and between work very, very often. Um, so they, they, were, they were paying for my gym membership. And at any point, they could have just went, no, you're, you're, you're going too mad with this because I was, I was being so, so all or nothing with it. It was like, I'm doing this and I'm doing it a hundred percent. Um, so could you imagine if they had have put those rules and restrictions in there? It's like, okay, well you can't do this anymore. There probably would be no coach Steve and the world would be a much darker place. hundred percent, hundred percent. But again, we don't realize we can only, what is it? We can only connect the dots looking backwards or Lenny and that kind of lighting the street lights. You can only connect them or see what you're doing looking back. It's exactly the same. Like these things sometimes align and we can't see at the time how profound an input or influence they are to our journey forward. I know. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's probably because you're in the middle of it. 
Do you know what I mean? Like you're 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 right bang in the middle of it, and the storm's there. It's like trying to wait for the clouds to, to dissipate and go away, and then you're like, oh, how the hell did I get here? Mm. Yeah. And when you were kind of on this journey and and have been and will and and still on, what are the kind of challenges that stand out? Because no doubt along that journey it's easier to go back it's easier to go back to netflix box sets and one pound pizza from asda and all that kind of stuff so what were some of the challenges and like how did you kind of move through them and move and and still kind of commit to moving forward when it's easier to move back um with with my particular case um it's it, it was a social kind of thing so when i was you know not going to the gym and stuff it would have been um out weekends with my friends drinking all the time having takeaway food this that and the other um and even i remember i think it was my sister's 20th or 21st birthday party was coming up and she had organized this big party and there was going to be drinks and food and stuff at it. And I remember having this like, Oh, no, I know. I don't think that I can, I'll go, but I'm not, I'm not going to be drinking at it or I'm not going to have any of the buffet or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and then people telling me that you're changing. Do you mean? And like, that's, that's a big hitter. It's, it's like, it's nice whenever people are saying that you're changing and appreciating like the change and they're like, what? Well, you know, like if, you know, uh, physical transformation, oh, you're looking really well, you know, like, wow, you're doing so, so good. This is, this is brilliant. But having people say to you that you're changing in a negative way, when you yeah. think that you, when, when in your head, you're going, I'm, I'm doing something good. And they're yeah. going, nah, you're, you're not as fun anymore. Like you're boring and, you know, like when are you, when are you ever going to live a little and all this here kind of carry on? Do you know what I mean? So that, that would be one of the challenges um, with my particular story, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd obviously sent out the, the idea of the podcast and the questions and stuff. So I've had a wee bit of time to, to think about the challenges. Um, and I think one of the main ones for me was the idea of growing up and the responsibility that was coming you know like it was it was so easy to lie on the sofa and just say oh there's just no work or there's just no plays going on and it's all about who you know and i have to watch this movie because such and such is a great actor and i'm gonna learn so much you know what i mean it's um like i i i didn't want to grow up i didn't want to mature um because my lifestyle was going out and drinking and partying and having fun with my friends and X, Y, and Z. But it didn't matter how many times I said that to myself, you know, like, oh, I wish I could just stop doing this. It was like, no, because in July, whether you like it or not, everything's going to change. Yeah. And you, you're, you're either going to be ready for it or you're not. And if you're not ready for it, it's going to be a hell of a lot worse than if you just do some of the sucky stuff now. Do you know what I mean? So it's um, the idea of hard things, easy life, easy things, hard life. So if you take the easy way out, things are going to be a bit of a struggle. Yeah. And if you don't put yourself in, out of your comfort zone, then you'll never really be able to adapt whenever, because something's like, something's going to come along, it's going to kick you in the face. And if you're not used to that kind of thing, You'll, you'll probably be like the ostrich sticking its head in the sand or you'll, you'll shy away or you'll freak out or whatever it is. I mean, I'm not saying that it's, you'll still freak out if you're prepared because it's kind of unplanned and whatever, but you'll be in a better position to deal with the things that are coming up. Um, so yeah, I, I really didn't want to mature and I didn't want to grow up and I didn't want responsibility because I never had it, but it was coming whether I liked it or not. So I just kind of had to get on with it. That was it. It's the, the, the analogy I've heard about that kind of 
feeling is like Peter Pan in Neverland mm-hmm. where he doesn't want to grow up and you go to this Neverland place where you're always a child. And again, if you think of Michael Jackson, he created his own amusement park so that he could have the childhood he didn't have. And if you pair that with, you had to, you didn't have to, you chose to take on the responsibility that you knew was on on its way rather than feeling like you had to. So you took choice and took on the responsibility, which is, Jordan Peterson would say the reason why men particularly would struggle with some of this is because we're built for responsibility. And when we don't take it on, we're like, what's our purpose? Mm. So we get lost without responsibility, but when we choose to take it on, we live up to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I I like that. I was, um, it's, it's, the, the the forward thinking of it as well it was like like you'd mentioned there i didn't have to take the responsibility but it was thinking because about the circumstances Steven. yeah people yeah. don't people ignore oh child doesn't matter drinking yeah right? and, and and i had that kind of thing in my head um it was like yeah i probably don't need to do this mm-hmm. but is it going to be the, is it going to be the best way is it, is it, you know, do I want to be, you know, out of breath whenever I take my kid up to a park or when he's climbing all over me, you know, I, I, I didn't want that at all. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And some people choose it and that's, that's their decision. That's up to them to, to do what they want to do. But for me, I was thinking about those circumstances and I was like, that's not the way that I want to do it. Mm. So um the responsibility was forced not forced but it was it was coming <laughs> the responsibility was coming yeah and i accepted it because it was for me the right choice in that situation to do yeah <clears throat> and it's probably one of the things for me that i'm paying attention to is if myself and katie have kids i want to be the dad that I want to be and it will involve just paying attention to how I am differently there he is there's Oliver hello Oliver he can't hear hello. me but hello hey Oliver how are you you can't hear Good. yeah you doing all right you playing with Lego uh no oh you're what not you allowed do? to play Fortnite though right um, I was doing nothing. <laughs> doing yeah, nothing. That means, nice. That means you were doing something. <laughs> Up to no good, probably. <laughs> you see you later, we did. Yeah, I wanna watch. I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you soon, okay? Daddy, I need to eat you. Okay, Phil, can you give me two V seconds? Sorry. Yeah, don't worry. So just for anybody listening, what's happening is role modeling, being a good dad. And Steve-O being there for his son. It's the way it should be. (laughs) He's not allowed to play Fortnite because when he plays Fortnite, the internet drops. So he's he's now off of my phone downloading a game. (laughs) (laughs) That is what this is all about. No need to apologize. I love it. That's like, Steve, oh, this is life. There's no perfect podcast episode. Like life is this. What did I talk about with the butterfly and caterpillar? Do you remember how I described the middle part? 
The cocoon? The... Yeah, the cocoon, but it's a beautiful, messy middle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what life is. So it's perfect. <laughs> and Oliver, I'm so glad he joined us. Thank and you, man, to say hello. Yeah. I think he's just a bit bored without his Fortnite. <laughs> I get that. I get that. So when, when you think about all of those challenges and you think about all of that. So how did you, how do you look after yourself and all of that's going on? How do you like continue to move yourself forward and towards whatever it is that you were navigating? Um, I, I kind of go quiet whenever I have some sort of challenge going on. I, I get very quiet and Probably at the very start, I don't react. Um, I might, I might have a feeling about it, mm. but uh, in terms of a reaction to that, I'm, I'm probably slow to the mark there. So, um, I like to think things through a wee bit, and it may not be clear. It, you know, it may not be the right way of thinking about it, but I at least need to just consider stuff. Um. So once the, the kind of challenges come along, then I've thought about it. I, I, I need to say it to somebody. Uh, I need to talk it, this, talk it through with somebody and try and do something. Um, <clears throat> usually, if it's to do with work and there's a challenge there, um, it's usually PJ or Lenny. Um, if it's stuff at home, I, I, I think I'm more quiet at home. I, I kind of don't talk whenever there's something going on with me. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it doesn't even have to be anything too big. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be anything too crazy or, I mean, if I have a bad couple of days, you know, I might have a bit of a, I'm, I'm a bit quieter, but I don't talk about it, which is probably stereotypical man behavior. No, um, it could be introvert. So you need to process internally before sharing, or I don't know if perfectionism shows up for you either, that you need to feel like it's good before you can share it. Sometimes that can show up for people. So it's not sometimes, it's not always typical man. It's just sometimes different things play out before we feel comfortable sharing so you're normal you're fine you're perfect yeah, I, th I think what you said there kind of makes sense to me a wee bit as well like you know, like i like to know that things are okay and done and then i'll go wait to hear what happened yeah. um so it's it, yeah it's it, i probably talk about the story of what happened how i dealt with it what the outcome was or what's going to happen next i think that's mm. kind of more more like me yeah um so so thinking about things um I, I like to try and get depend on the problem obviously but as physically involved in it as i can so if there's if there's problem at the gym i'm right okay let me let me get to get to the gym try and figure out how to fix this yeah um i'm 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 I, I don't really know that I have a process. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think, I think it depends on what comes my way. The, the way that I react to it or the way that I deal with it changes. Um, the severity and the urgency obviously have a, a part to play mm -hmm. in that as well. Um, I've talked to you in a conversation before about procrastination and you put it back to me that it's probably the, the deadline, I can't remember exactly how you put it, but whenever I know that the deadline's coming up, that's when I do my best work. Um, and, and that really makes sense to me because like I said, if the, if the problem's urgent and important, I, I get stuff done. If it's not so important and not so urgent, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll mull it over. I'll think about different possible ways of, you know, sorting it out knowing that I've got time, but at the end of it, I'll, I'll make a decision and, I'll, and, and stuff will happen. Um, so yeah, 
I, th I think. I, I, can you remember how you described that to me? So with the procrastination thing, there's a video that I think it's Tim Urban, whose page on Instagram or his website is Wait But Why. Unbelievable guy, super bad at drawing, but he uses drawings to explain some of these ideas. So with procrastination, it's that if you don't have a deadline, of course you're going to procrastinate because what's the motivation or what's the impetus or, or, or trigger for action? There's none. But when you give yourself a deadline, what he calls is like your monkey brain or your procrastination monkey in your mind has a deadline, so has to act. And that can sometimes be really powerful. Oh, this is a password now for Oliver to download the app. You're going to be charged a million pounds, Steve-O. <laughs> but more or less, if anybody listening wants to decrease procrastination, the antidote is give yourself a deadline. I linked the TED Talk, Steve-O, to mm. anything that I send out because it's a powerful thing. Um, procrastination is just you haven't given yourself a deadline. And I learned yeah. that off a guy who's on one of the first podcasts on this one, Ben Heron. And I'm like, it's so simple, but it's so powerful. Yeah, that, 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 that really, that, that's, that's me. The, 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 I work well to a deadline, even university and stuff. Like I remember being up all night for assessments the night before. And I mean, I got a degree, so it must have, it must have worked. <laughs> If you if you watch that TED talk, because he talks about exactly the same thing, where it's like, mm. oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit often over time, and it's like eventually it just kind of increases closer to the deadline. Like, <laughs> no, I have to do an all nighter, like a three all nighter. Uh, it's so <laughs> funny, but it's exactly the same. So, yeah, again, welcome to being human. Yeah, yeah, it's good to know that I'm not alone in that. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're when you're navigating some of those kind of challenges or things, and you're kind of depending on the challenge or problem you're diagnosing and acting on it very differently How, like what do you focus on to keep making sure you're moving forward rather than being distracted or caught up in that chaos um probably the the thing that would come to mind would be what do i want to happen um, and then, then you can start thinking about ways that you can get closer to that mm. and thinking about actions that you could take that may lead you there. It, it may not be the right decision. It may not be the right action to do, but like you have to do something. Um, the only thing you can do is with your best judgment and thinking process, you know, think about where it is that you want to go. What are all the possible ways that could get you there and try them. Mm. Um, so it could come from difficult conversations. It could be, do I need to ask for help? Do I need to ask somebody who, you know, maybe I don't have the skills to help with this particular problem. Okay, well, I, I need to get from the problem to where I want to be. Who Who's the person that's going to bridge that for me? Or at least, you know, put me in touch with somebody who can help. Do you know what I mean? Um, which I think that can be more difficult for me because I close in. Do you know what I mean? I, get, I, I, I kind of shut off and think about it myself. And the, the thought of asking somebody probably comes later. I, I did a post about this today. On your Instagram? Yeah, and it shows the difference when stress is present, how differently our eyes, literally, how differently our focus changes from forest to single tree. So literally, the possibilities that you will see for your problem solving narrow significantly. So the undoing yeah. of that is like, uh, this is why I studied to be a PT, Steve, if I'm really honest, the physiology of stress, we hold it somatically. So in our muscles and our 
our skin and every every part of our being we can literally shake it out of us with different exercises and so then instead of that narrow view and again there's breathing exercises there's reframes all this kind of stuff literally it widens our mind so that we can problem solve more expansively and less selfishly so when you narrow you will only ever preserve self because you're focused on survival rather than let me think longer term and more expansively and there's mm. it, check out the post i hope you enjoy it but you'll see visually and um, there's a guy andy huberman so from huberman lab at stanford his podcast he talked about this and there's a really good video i just took that as a screenshot from it and it's so powerful but it shows how stress affects everybody's ability to handle and problem solve or make decisions or strategically think or any of that kind of stuff it's crazy yeah i like it um the, the did you mention it i can't remember if it was you mentioned it yeah it was it was the idea of um Whenever you feel the pressure and the stress, give yourself a big sigh. So, mm. <sighs> and that, that that kind of change that so goes along with that. It's nervous well. system regulation. So when you're in a stress state, your nervous system is in a chaotic space and we can measure about heart rate variability. So we can show you your heart in that state and the move from that to what's called a coherent state one of the ways to do it is through your breathing. So one way is sighing. Mm -hmm. So sighing was this kind of healing way when you were a child that would make you feel okay. Or you see people and they, oh, like they huff or why mm -hmm. people smoke. It's not the inhale. It's actually the exhale is always longer. And when you exhale longer than your inhale, you literally lower your heart rate. Yeah. You de-stress. So when you are triggered in a stressful situation, your heart rate increases, palms get sweaty, the focus narrows to solve the problem. If you were to smoke, you breathe in a little bit, but you focus on breathing out and doing shapes and stuff. So your exhale is longer, lowers your heart rate. Of course you feel calmer. And you've yeah. allowed your amygdala, your fight, flight, freeze, re freeze response to reduce and settle. So of course, then your cognitive mind will actually switch back on because it hasn't been taken over by your amygdala and of course you can solve problems differently mm -hmm. it's crazy but it I starts know. with a sigh yeah or breathe in for the same rhythm you breathe out as an example four in four out five and five out or just extend the exhale yeah I, I i like the the timed breathing i would mm. do that so the four in four out okay i use um i don't know if you use it the headspace app yeah so a lot of those for going to sleep and stuff yeah and you know like you, you, your, your mind runs you know what i mean you're thinking about especially especially if you're up very early in the morning like me you're thinking am i going to sleep in what have i got to do who's going to book yeah. in i'm going to make sure that everything runs smoothly and you're like no i need to be going to sleep so then yeah. those breathing things really really help with that as yeah. well yeah it's a uh, we're awakening to the power of the body hence vitamin p vitamin that's what it's p. about it's vitamin physiology mm. it's all connected 100 and in a it's it seems crazy but it's like whenever you talk about it it's it's so obvious mm. and like if you see th there's a really good book uh why zebras don't get ulcers and more or less yeah. it's when they experience a stressful event they violently shake the stress out of their bodies. So that's a survival instinct, but a processing step or action. We soak in stress all the time, hence heart attacks, ulcers, all of these kind of illnesses that could be reduced, but it's typically because all the stress happens in the way that we frame the world. And the antidote is your body. Moving moving shaking hugging connecting breathing. breathing water forests it's trees all, like I, I don't know if you saw i put up on instagram today like for everybody now that i work with i'm katie has been able to i've, I've said I, like katie helps me with so many things 
so that I'm a little bit more productive and show up and do things like this a little bit better and don't have to worry about other stuff. But she found one of the, one of the things that I asked her, can we figure it out is a charity or a way that you can buy trees for people. Yeah. So there's a place in Scotland, story, actually. there's a place in Scotland and they can do that. So that's great. So is it, is it a tree that's already there or are they going to plant the tree for you or what do they do? It. That's they great. Plant it. And I just get proof of proof of plant. <laughs> you get a certificate for every yeah. tree that you plant. Yeah. So I want stacks You're gonna need of them. another bookshelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, I, I want to try and offset some of the journals and books that I send people, you know, but also it's the metaphor around growth and, new potential mm. well that's that's why i sent the the quote to you yeah from that from that story yeah it just kind of reminded me of it as well there's the you know because you're talking about the potential of the tree and the characteristics and we've had a couple of conversations about this before um but the legacy that it has as well that that quote um society grows great when men plant trees they will never sit in the shade of yeah and it's like doing things for the for the next generation do you know what i mean and what kind of legacy that's going to leave and stuff as well so that's yeah. a that's a nice one to add to the whole idea of the trees yeah so tell me about some of the lessons you've learned from this journey that you've been on what advice would you give yourself when you were starting out for example don't take things too seriously. Don't th take things too seriously. Um, I've adopted that more in the last probably five years, five, six years. Um, at the very, very beginning, especially whenever you're in the room with the likes of PZ and Lenny who know their stuff, do you mean you're like, oh, I got to keep up with these guys? And they're like, okay, well, all right, you've been doing it a year. They've been doing it, you know, years before you and stuff. Um, but also, like like I was saying to you about, you know, I love helping people and I love getting people from A to B and their fitness goals and this, that, and the other. Um, but I love the connections that we make with people. And actually, that's what, the majority of it is the the books on personal training and the science behind nutrition um i've changed bits and pieces i suppose but fundamentally you know the same as any other coach or personal trainer when it comes to helping somebody what gain some muscle or lose some weight or whatever it is but there's there's a reason that people are with you and there's a reason why people like your sessions and you get along with them and like my, my whole my whole idea about a personal training session or a group session is these guys have chose to be here and i'm going to make it the best star of their day um because then they'll probably come back again tomorrow and you build that relationship with them. So don't take things too seriously. I felt like at the start when I was, you know, coaching and stuff, um, I needed to use the the correct terminology. And I felt that if I didn't know the answer to something, like if somebody asked me a question, why am I doing this? Or, you know, what, you know, if, you know, how, how do I go about losing whatever? And I'm like, oh, I, I feel like I should have the answer and I can't say that I don't know. And it's, it's cool to not know because then what, what you can say is, I honestly don't know, but you know what I will do? I'll go and find out. I'll go and find out and I'll learn it and come back to you. And then your relationship improves because there's trust instead of just saying something because you feel like you should have the answer to it. And then that person is just looking at you and going, you're, you're making things up. You're lying to my face. You have no idea about what you're talking about. This doesn't make sense. You're stuttering, you're whatever. Um, so don't take, take things too seriously. Be okay with being wrong and saying that you don't know something. Yeah. 
because there's opportunity to learn there instead of walking around like you know it all because how born would that be <laughs> if you knew everything 100 percent. and i i was just looking up a quote that i heard earlier on today and it's an osho quote and it's courage is a love affair with the unknown oh i like that I'm like oh my goodness i love it it's so good it's just so good and this is about you. It's not about me, but can I tell you a story about a recent therapy session I had? Mm. Go ahead. You, you know the way I talk about these kind of closing in and protecting you from life. So we create these stories or beliefs or things or shoulds like BMW drivers are bad. So therefore I feel more certain about my world because I'm not one of them. Right. So it yeah. closes life from us. And it helps us feel more certain when literally in the next moment, we don't know what's going to happen. So it helps us feel an element of certainty in a world that is all uncertain. Hmm. So when you release some of those stories and embrace and get comfortable with the unknown and the uncertainty, literally, you just see life as it is and you're able to be it's like slowing down to the speed of life you haven't created these cages around you and what life must look like before you're happy before you're confident before you're content or successful or whatever it just is and you just are too yeah and that was a massive thing for me in in trying to create the conditions for acting on something if that makes sense so waiting for perfect or when it's this i want to make sure i'm responsible yeah yeah it's the 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 idea of what is it that you want to do do you want to get to the top of the mountain or do you want to take in the view on your way there do you know what i mean that's enjoy enjoy the process of it because I mean, we, we kind of talk about it like you were, I was saying about um, you might make the wrong decision, but you got to make a decision regardless and you just get on with it. You deal with the circumstances, the consequences when they arise. Mm. So you kind of have to embrace that lack of certainty because you don't know if what you're going to do is going to be the right way forward. If you make a mistake, you can't, you know, fall on the floor like a toddler and give off about it. And when you get to the top of the mountain, it might be the wrong mountain. But that doesn't have to be a bad thing because the fields and the scenery that you, yeah. you've seen on the way could have been just as good. Yeah, 100%. And um, Side Guru, a guy whose stuff I love, I just love it. He's a book called uh, Inner, Inner Engineering, A Yogi's Guide to Joy. And he says humans are built for climbing mountains. And that it's all like life is just a series of climbs. But again, like you say, it's important to make sure you're looking at the journey, not just what you're not at. Mm. It's yeah. cool. I really like that. Like, And um, then it probably goes along to say the, the whole question, like, what next? So like if, could you imagine like you, you get to the, the top of what Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world, isn't it? So you get to the top of your Mount Everest and then you have that question, right? Now what? And you're like, there's no nowhere else to go. Or do you find another mountain? If you find the other mountain, you have to gotta go back down that one. You you know, you better enjoy the journey because you don't want to just get to the top and be still stuck and wanting. Yeah, Tony Robbins talks about this when he was coaching, I can't remember, maybe Neil Armstrong or something like that when they got back from the moon. Because it's like, what what do I do now? <laughs> so his work was to teach those astronauts how to find joy in a child's smile or their day. Hmm. You know? Because yeah. they're they're not fair to compare one to the other. 
but actually it's all just life. It just depends on the story or the frame we hold about what it is and who we are. I'm not good enough until I'm Mars next or whatever it is. So again, it's all just bullshit. We all just make this stuff up. We may as well make it serve us. Yeah. It, it, might, it might be a way of people... I don't know, this is kind of just coming to my head as I'm saying it. So I'm trying to find the words. But right. people like to be seen to be doing something. Does that make sense? People like to be seen to be working towards something or trying to achieve a certain thing or trying to save up for something or at the end of the month, I'm going to go to wherever. Mm. So putting i'm just thinking about objects mostly you know like yeah. I'll, I'll i'll be happy when i get this car or i'll yeah. be happy when i've done whatever and you're like well why why can't you just be happy talking to me <laughs> and and yeah. whatever well that's exactly the conditions between us and the feeling when if we let go of those conditions we can just have the feeling now and I would disagree. Not everyone wants to achieve stuff. Some people are just content, but probably okay. not actually happy. They're just afraid of, they're stuck in circumstance. And they think that there's no alternative. So they derail into negative behaviors. Where actually, I think everybody is drawn to more. We just don't know how to do it all the time. So we think there's nothing else. So we just deteriorate or what is it? It's either growth or entropy. So, so do you think that that comes from the, the kind of self-limiting talk that people have, or is that not knowing that there's more, or where do you think that that would come from? I, I think sometimes it's an inability to handle discomfort and that familiar pain is more comfortable than unknown happiness or joy or insert word here hmm. so is it the the idea of the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know that is that what you is that what you yeah, mean it's it, like at, le at least i know that um i can handle what's going on now if i try and do something else and it's worse i don't know if i could handle it because it's different yeah like this hamster wheel that i'm on of drinking at the weekends and not doing anything really in life like if you extend that over 40 years that scares the shit out of me steve-o mm. i don't want that to be my life right so the people that are like that, I, I, I have to distance myself. But I, I, I don't know that they see what's going on. Or, again, like you're saying, because if we go back to the fly story that I told at the start of the summit as well, is I, I talked to this about, a, I, I talked about that kind of concept to a, another sports psychologist. He worked at Raleigh Ireland and some like really professional cycling teams. And as their psychologist, it's amazing. And I was saying to him about the fly story, about flying into the window and under the trap of, if I try harder, well, then I'll succeed. But not knowing there's a door to the right that's open and they'd achieve success, which is getting outside. And what he said is, at least we feel like we're doing something and we know the pain of banging into the window. We don't want the unknown. And I'm like, that's it. Oh my goodness, that's it. Yeah. So the known, or as, as you said, that kind of familiar devil is keeping so many people stuck. And in that Outwitting the Devil book by Napoleon Hill, drifting. Yeah. And I just don't just, want to be a drifter. I just can't. I can't do it. Just uh, letting things happen to them instead of making things happen giving for out about them. it. <laughs> yeah because it's easy to be negative and blame everything else about life rather than actually taking responsibility again back to what we were talking about before
taking on responsibility is hard mm. but it's easier than the discomfort that comes from regret yeah but probably the the only time that you realize that is when it's too late exactly exactly so when you when you go back to your friends or social circles or those groups that were saying you're changing and they were they weren't positive about you changing how do you return back so who are you now when you're back at that kind of home or uh, like social circles that you were in before um i don't kind of like yourself you were saying about kind of distancing um from that i i associate with some of them still um but the majority of them i don't Mm. um I think it was we were we're all kind of immature at the time. So the the ones who meant it, you know, like oh you're changing, you're changing, blah blah blah. Like I was like, well, like you're you're not really going to be up to much anyway. Do you know what I mean? You, sometimes you can just tell. I don't know why, but you can just tell. But the ones who I'm able to socialize with now are yeah, still going out at weekends and drinking, partying, stuff like that there, but they've they've their own responsibilities to get on with as well. And they take those seriously. And like I'm not I'm not here to tell anybody what to do with their their free time or whatever. But as long as you're I, I like someone who's got ambition. Do you know what I mean? So one, one of the people who <laughs> who would have said it but wouldn't have meant it, he's probably my best friend. Okay, I don't like saying my best friend because I have lots of best friends. I thought I was your best friend, Steve. Yeah, no, don't get hurt. Don't get hurt. Well, I'm going to get kicked off your podcast soon. Video has ended. I don't know what happened there, Steve, but I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> Where's that mute button? Video off. Turn it off. <laughs> Recording has ended. <laughs> um, Goodbye. No, so this so will sound destroyed in thirty seconds. <laughs> you, you're going to come through the screen like the girl from the ring, just like yeah. reach for me. Yeah. Um, the, so the so one of the, one of my friends. Um, who would have said it messing about and stuff like from, from school, we've been best friends. Um, he's now my brother-in-law. He, the, the other one of my friends who would have said it and not meant it is Kieran McNichol, who was the guy who first got me to go to the gym. Yeah. Kieran is probably one of the most hard working people that I know, hands down. Um, he had a job for Coca Cola. He works for what are water wipes now? I think the company's called. But even from university, like, I know him from university, and he just was like, um, if you could bottle ambition, it would be it would be him. He was like, I'm going to do this, and now you know what? I'm going to get a placement with Coca Cola, and I'm going to go to America for a year, and then ended up living in America after that. And then came home. It was. It, it is such a, a a good work ethic, and he always wants more. But he also hosts a great party, and has his round for dinner like once a month or once every two months or something. And that's our social life with with Kieran. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, my brother in law ran. Uh, he's the same. I've known him from secondary school. He, like, and he, like I, I call him the Chandler of our kind of group because I know that he works with like science and medicine and stuff, but no one actually really knows what his job title is. <laughs> you see that in France? He's a he's a trans monster. 
Um, but it's because he always goes for promotions. If he was doing the same thing every time that I talked to him, I would know what his job title is or his job yeah. role is now. Yeah. But he's always going for promotions. He's always going for different jobs. He's moving about the company all the time. And at the same time, like he's my brother-in-law, know him from school. That's that's how him and my sister met from our social circle. Everybody out drinking every single weekend, partying until stupid o'clock in the morning. They've got a they've got a son now. I'm his godfather. You know what I mean? So we can still do all those fun, sociable things, but there's ambition and there's responsibility among those people. And I can relate to that now because I've got my responsibilities and I've got my ambitions yeah. and I am able to have a bit more balance in my life yeah. because I can't, I can like, I can't be all or nothing with any of it because something will fall apart. If I'm all or nothing with work, I, I probably, I, I probably dedicate a lot more time to work. Um, I should probably take a few steps back, but it's 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 not costing. My family, like we have a, a fantastic family, brilliant relationship with Oliver, with Janice, with everybody. Um, so if you were to go all or nothing with just family, then you know your career would take a hit. If you went all or nothing with your career, your family would take the hit. So. I stopped hanging about with the people who were all or nothing with the wrong things and gravitated and stuck around with the people who found a good balance with the responsibilities that they had, as well as being good people and being good fun to be with. I kind of forget what the question was. I hope that I answered it. <laughs> Uh, you did yeah because it's really just coming back home after that kind of journey and adventure and challenge and guides and people along the way who you're coming back as and really it's a more grounded but more balanced rather than that all or nothing sense it's more a like a comfortable in the gray and comfortable with the right people around you that have that same balance so that that becomes the peer group you spend time with and li live up to the ambition but balanced ambition yeah, it, it's um, the challenge of being told, you know, you're changing probably isn't the way that I would have I've found the balance. I, th I think going from the discomfort of lying on a sofa and doing nothing and being a slob and blah, 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 not having any responsibilities in the world. But then on the other side of the scale, having narrow vision to improve and get better and finding that midpoint where it's like, you don't need to be one or the other. You can be both. Um, you're able to enjoy more whenever you're not all or nothing. Um, because if it was, yeah, I think, I think overall the two sides of the coin made me a better all round balanced person without taking, like my personality is the same. Like I haven't changed in terms of personality. I've changed in terms of priorities. I've changed in terms of getting a taste of responsibility and commitment and wanting ambition because I know what not having, having ambition looks and feels like. Yeah, I'm kind of rambling again. Not necessarily. So if you were to describe a hero, what words would you use to describe them? honest, 
pride. I don't know if I don't know if sneaky is the right word. I've got so I have I have a person in my head. And sneaky. it's my grand it's it's my granddad. It's sneaky. my granddad. It's sneaky in the sense that he's smarter than he lets on sometimes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um but he He does it to help and he does it to make you think differently as well. Um so I don't I don't know if sneaky is um is the right word. So it's um you like you might you might be having a conversation with him and he'd say, All right, well why why do you think that then? And and you, you and and so that's that's the best thing to do then, is it? And then you start doubting yourself, and you know, like he's he's really good that way. So that's what I mean when I mean sneaky. Like, um, honest, proud, a a leader who. people respect without being forced to um has a, basically has earned um respect um someone who is approachable and open and willing to help people. Um, because I think, would there be any heroes if there wasn't people who needed help? So, yeah, got to be able to be open, approachable, honest, all those things so that you can help people. This is the, you said about two sides of the same coin. You can't have light without dark. And it's exactly the same with this. Could you have heroes if you don't have people that need saving? And the answer is no. And that's the point, you know? We see it yeah. as a bad thing when a journey has been difficult, but we don't realize that contributes to the joy of arriving or reaching a point is because of the struggle. Yeah. And as someone looking on, like I'm just thinking about that line in Tesco's that you were talking about at the very start, um, as someone looking on, if you knew the story and you knew the struggles that the person had gone through, you could go, maybe I could do it. Maybe it's maybe it's not so bad then. Maybe it's something that I'd take on. Uh, there's a, a quote about that, which is, if we all threw our problems into a pile, you would take yours back fairly quickly. Yeah, I've heard that one before. It's so true. You know, we were, we were talking about this last night. We were talking, me and Janice were talking about a block of flats. And it was kind of like the same thing. It was like, I mean, Janice loves people watching. So when we go on holidays, she's well, always people watching. She'll look at a block of flats. She's just like, there's so many stories going on in there. And you don't yeah. even know what's happening. You yeah. don't even know. You Everybody just has their own wee world. And we're just kind of looking on at people's worlds going on around from, us from within ours yeah yeah and if we didn't exist life would still be there yeah there's just nobody conscious of it it's crazy like it'll blow your mind. all that stuff is it's amazing i love it i love it is there any questions i should have asked you 
Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I think that it's. He killed the boss. He nailed it, bro. <laughs> I. I. I don't think so. I think that the. The questions. Oliver. Good man. <laughs> I think that the, the questions and the story and. The the hero story is what it is because everybody can relate to it and everyone's seen it isn't it one of the things that um most movies use it as a format because everyone can identify the struggles and everyone identifies their point a and point b and where they want to get to and all that kind of stuff no i think i don't i don't think so but if um i think of anything i'm sure i can send you a message anyway i'll be seeing you in a few days as well you will have you have you any questions for me? Here's one because this is this is completely just for me, and I'm asking because it's 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 been a, a theme, like I said at the end there. Um, I'm quite a visual um, learner and. I love the idea of the tree because of the visual aspect of it. And it's easier for me to look to that as aspiration and, and stuff. So I mentioned about when you asked me, what should a hero be? I said, I've got my granddad in my mind. So I'm trying to think of all the things that he is. Um, when I think about being ambitious, I have a person in mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. And not in the sense that you would compare yourself to somebody else. So it's not like, I wish I was that person or I wish I had what they have or whatever. But do you think that there is a negative um, angle? I'm looking for a better word. Do you think there's a negative angle of having a person when it comes to ambition or where you want the to go or what you want to be like do you know like a like a mentor or a, someone who inspires you or whatever like when i think of those kind of people i have i have a person in my mind is it's not a comparison thing because i'm like oh if only i was better that i would i would be that person but is, do you think that there's any kind of negative things that go along with that kind of thinking where there's, I have one person in my mind and that's kind of what I'm using to drive myself forward with? So where my mind went to when you were describing that, and it's a great question, it, it's that anything you admire in somebody else, you already have within you that's why you recognize it in others. So if you notice, I, I wouldn't have used sneaky. I would have used humble, right? Okay. Your granddad. So recognizing that quality means you have that within you. So the negative could be that you don't realize you already embody or have the potential to embody it. You're just thinking it's separate from you. Okay. So going, going from that then. So if it's not drawn to your attention, like, like you've just done, like you've just said to me, you admire these qualities of people or whatever it's probably already within you and you recognize it mm -hmm. so what what can be done to help someone who doesn't know that they have the qualities without it being pointed out that that's the case that you you, you recognize it so it's within you 
Like how, how do you, how do you help someone with that? So you're trying to point it out to somebody else? Yeah. So or for yourself. So, well, 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 now that you've mentioned it to me, I know that if I look at somebody else and go, I really admire the way that they're doing that. And I go, oh, well, that must be a me now because you've just, you've just said that to me, but I'm thinking about for me going and helping somebody else and mm. saying, you know, like, oh, I wish that I could, you know, do this, that or the other. And I go, well, because you recognize that, you know, is, is it just the case of pointing it out to somebody or is there other ways that you can help that person see it for themselves? It, so I'm playing with it in a couple of ways, right? So one, one way is if it's in service of the other person and you have the awareness to be able to increase theirs to more of them playing up to who they could be, I, I think it's helpful to offer them that exercise or story around like who do you admire what do you admire about them did you know that that's because it's in you now just do more of that is the bright side of it the dark side is um said the monkey to the fish as it carried it up the tree i'm saving you from drowning right so with the best of intent, we can think we're helping other people when actually we might be removing the self-responsibility for that exploration of any of that. So I'm trying to play with it in two ways, but I, I think, so really good things and really bad things were done in the name of good intent, but I think we... My, my gut feeling is we, we live in a world that tells people what they can't be. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's probably helpful to represent possibility that people could question whether they could live up to the same possibilities. So it's probably a walk rather than talk. Okay. And I think then you won't get disappointed if people don't act on it because you have no, no expectation on them. It's a, I'm showing up as me. If you want to ask, you can ask so that your awareness is raised, but I'm not going to be disappointed by it either way, whether you do or don't. I think, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. That's, uh, I want to look into that more. Have you got anything that I could learn, <laughs> like read or watch or anything that I could look into that? Because that's, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I, I don't. I think no. you have to live it. You have to test yeah. it. You have to see it. And it's, it's coaching 101 is lose expectation. Passionate detachment. That's Buddhist kind of stuff. It's passionate detachment. You want to be really passionate about the conversation or the thing, but detached from any outcome that might come from it so that you can be non-judgmental, have no expectation. You just accept it as it is. Mm -hmm. And you, you equip them to take the responsibility for what's theirs to hold and you hold what's yours to hold. Yeah, that's... That, that that is the key the detachment thing is especially in the kind of industry that we're in you know like you're you're always trying to help people and you might just be i don't know why it came to my head you know watching a tv quiz and you're shouting the answer and the person's just not saying it yeah you can, it can come across as that kind of feeling where you just want to say just do this and then person just shuts down and ends exactly. up not doing it yeah exactly. okay Okay. It's the same Good. with Buddha found enlightenment, not from being protected within the castle walls as because he, he was a prince, 
but from being out and getting homeless and then coming back as the enlightened being that he was, right? So it's the same, let's say, for kids. We can think we're protecting them from the world, but we don't give them the opportunity to learn these skills of resilience because our intent is to help. I'm saving you from drowning. You're mm. not. Mm. You know? So it's, it's, it's a tension. You have to live that. You can't. You could read about it. It's the implementation on the other side that's actually the, the work. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it just takes time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it'll, it'll change from person to person as well. Because like the, the detachment, someone could get it there and then. Like kind of what happened whenever you had mentioned it to me. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Get that. Um, but when you say that, you probably didn't have that expectation for, for that to happen. Yeah, just need to practice. Practice it. Stephen Clark, thanks for being on the Everyday Heroes podcast. It's been a pleasure. Oh, cool, really? Thanks for being on the podcast too. Thanks for yeah. having the podcast and thanks for having me. You're welcome.